Our guest today is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Commonwealth Edison. She is responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of ComEd, which delivers electric service to customers throughout Northern Illinois. Commonwealth Edison has 5,700 employees and revenues of approximately $6.1 billion. ComEd delivers electricity to approximately 3.8 million residential and business customers across Northern Illinois, or 70% of the state's population. Our guest today is a graduate of DePaul University Law School, where she served as editor-in-chief of the school's law review. Ladies and gentlemen, Anne Promajori. And Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jay, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you, Father David. Your uh, invocation was as rousing as your sermons are, and we appreciate it. I appreciate you all coming out today. It is good to be in good company. And on the theme of good company, you may have met our ComEd ambassadors when you arrived today. I'm so proud that they could join us. These adults are part of the country's first ever energy efficiency program designed for and taught by people with developmental disabilities. We selected them for the program because they are great communicators and they care about the environment. To thank them for their hard work, Maurice, Michael, Maureen, Christian, Lisa, Catherine, Tim, and Jess, are going to receive an official State of Illinois Certificate of Achievement to take home and show off. So we're delighted that they're here today. I'm delighted to be at the City Club. It's a wonderful forum to raise and discuss issues of significant public import in depth. I'm particularly grateful because it's very difficult to address our complex energy narrative in pieces or sound bites due to its complexity and the emotional chord it often evokes. But I'd like to start today by commenting on the most recent piece of the energy narrative, and Father David referenced this, and that's the impact of Hurricane Sandy on the le electrical infrastructure of the East Coast. This was a devastating storm that caused loss of lives and a human and economic toll that is just beginning to be understood. More homes and businesses lost power as a result of Sandy than any other in history, and the losses are projected to be in the $50 billion range. I want to commend the 900 men and women, managers and linemen, employees of ComEd, and our partners Meet Electric, MJ Intren, who left home over two weeks ago and have been working in very difficult conditions to help people on the East Coast recover from this catastrophe. Uh, I want to in particular thank Tyler Anthony, uh, one of our vice presidents who went out there and uh, left home, spent many weeks out there leading the troops. Thank you. When people have been without power and isolated for days and even weeks now, the sight of these line trucks and our crews coming into the community is truly uplifting. And I'd like to recognize their extraordinary efforts and thank their families for supporting this. Thank you for allowing me to thank them. I believe that anyone coming to speak before the City Club should offer a new perspective. The goal should be either to introduce, introduce a brand new idea or take something that we've been looking at for a long time and present it through a new lens. And I'll attempt to do a little bit of both today as I walk through my perspective on Illinois energy policy. We've had some high profile energy debates in Illinois over the last decade, most recently around smart grid, and it would be easy to gravitate there. But I think that focus is like looking at a big breathtaking landscape through a pinhole. You're looking at something, you may discern a shape, but you are surely missing the big picture and likely the real import of the landscape. So for my time with you today, I want to take a giant step back, attach a wide angle lens to the camera, and look at the energy world through a broader perspective. 
The lens I want to attach will allow us to view recent questions around energy policy and the power grid in the context of the larger landscape. The landscape is quite simply the most significant economic and social turn in the road of the last 100 years, the transformation in communications technology. Calling this phenomenon the third industrial revolution, commentators are noting that digitization, the intersection of communications and energy, is the new driver of economic prowess. Through this lens, the questions we should be asking ourselves are, does our energy policy provide our city, our region, our state with the capability to accelerate through this turn in the road? Or does it act as a drag and cause us to sputter into the new economy without direction or momentum? So what does the third industrial revolution look like? While a somewhat staid US economy showed growth rates of about 1.5% from 1972 through 1995, our growth rate was a compelling 2.6% per year uh, between 1995 and the early 2000s, driven primarily by the IT producing sectors. This was happening, of course, as teenage computer whizzes became billionaires, turning Silicon Valley into the growth capital of the United States. This third industrial revolution is notable here in Chicago as well, where we are changing the face of our traditional economic strongholds. Manufacturing is not your father's Oldsmobile. You would be hard pressed to find a manufacturing facility today that does not rely on microprocessors, robots, and other digital technology to run assembly lines and overall systems. Our Ford plant runs off of microprocessors, and our Chrysler plant in Belvedere consists, has a body shop. It's the first Chrysler plant to have a body shop that consists entirely of robots, 780 robots that can switch cycles in 45 seconds and make three different automobile models. In the healthcare field, another traditional driver for our regional economy, reliance on digital technology is moving beyond MRIs into proton beam cancer therapies and is being greatly accelerated by the federal mandate to convert all medical records in the United States to an electronic format by 2014. As significantly, Chicago is capturing more than a second city share of the new digital economy. Chicago is fast becoming the country's major nerve center by virtue of its concentration of fiber optic networks and data centers. These monoliths of data storage and transmission stream data around the globe 24 hours per day, seven days per week, and make Chicago, and I quote from Crane Chicago, the place where the internet happens. Chicago is emerging as the Silicon Prairie, a hotbed of investment in technology and the cradle of 21st century digital entrepreneurship. With the support of organizations like Chicago Next, World Business Chicago and the establishment of 1871, the new hub for tech entrepreneurship, Chicago is launching a new digital startup every 48 hours. That's momentum. So together, these forces are transforming the city of big shoulders, hog butcher to the world, stormy, husky, brawling, into the city of sparkling minds, nerve center for the world, cyber, sleek, streaming, and for the 21st century, the city that works. But all of you know this. You live this every day. How many bank online? OK, at least half. How many shop online? I know I'm going to get more than half on that. <laughs> yep, yep, heading into the holidays. Anybody go to school online? Almost all our educational uh, institutions in the Chicago area offer online courses or <coughs> online degrees. And I'm not going to ask you this one, but consider the monumental shift in human relationships. You can find a road trip partner on Zimride, you can find a long lost partner on Facebook, and you can find a life partner on Cupid.com. <laughs> So we bank, shop, study, and live online. But why does this all matter to the people in this room? And why does the electric grid, or how does the electric grid fit into this revolution? 
Well, a modern grid and a companion energy policy matters, and it matters very much. The grid powers the great information age. The grid powers the digital economy. The grid powers our lives. The grid is the core economic infrastructure for the 21st century, and it matters to you because as policy and business leaders, you work every day to invigorate our economy and propel our city and state forward. It matters to ComEd because our job is to provide you with the infrastructure to do this. The dilemma is that today we have an energy sector whose technology was largely designed 100 years ago for an economy that peaked 50 years ago and was fundamentally transformed 20 years ago. The American Academy of Engineers referred to the grid as one of the top engineering marvels of the 20th century. However, the Association of Civil Engineers gives the US grid a very low grade for its ability to support the 21st century economy. For the power sector, success for our industry and by implication the economy will be measured by new standards. Success in the 21st century will be defined less by the 20th century's one-dimensional notion of reliability on or off than by the quality of the grid, voltage and current, balance and consistency. Less by the 20th century one-dimensional standard of product price, too high versus barely tolerable, and design, one size fits all, than by pricing transparency and pricing and product options. Less by the notion of sheer energy supply capacity than by the technical flexibility required to support the myriad choices consumers will make, and less by investment decisions driven by the luck of growth or short-term cost than by the long-term value generated for consumers. Many missed the turn in the road that is our third industrial revolution, but I would argue that Illinois did not miss this turn. While there is little that resembles a coherent energy policy around us these days, Illinois has the framework of a strong energy policy and possibly one of the most innovative models for the future. We have not achieved the end state, but we have charted a course. So what's happened in Illinois? Allow me to start with an element of our policy that has captured significant attention this year, and that is consumer energy shopping. The foundation for this phenomenon was laid in 1997 when the General Assembly passed a deregulation act that had the effect of creating a marketplace for power. And this work is now beginning to bear fruit. By mid-2013, more than 72% of the residential customers in ComEd will buy their power from a competitive retailer. Consumer groups have stated that customers in Chicago alone could save $100 million by June of next year. Now that's a big number, but the savings ComEd customers have seen over the last 14 years as a result of restructuring and customer choice is far bigger. By 2005, residential customers had saved about $3.5 billion due to the legislation's rate reduction. And when we add the savings achieved since 2005 and by businesses as well, analysts place the number in the tens of billions of dollars saved. Since 1997, energy prices on average across the U.S. have increased 38 percent. But electric energy prices for consumers at ComEd have increased less than one-third of that amount, 11 percent. ComEd's residential rates are 20 percent below the average of the 10 largest cities in the United States. And we now have 40 retail energy markets, marketers who are offering even more savings. Energy policy is working in Illinois because it has given us a competitive advantage in attracting energy intensive businesses like data centers and because it improves the budgets and lives of consumers. Energy policy matters. Turning to the grid. Last year, the General Assembly passed some of the most progressive energy policy legislation in the country with the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act or Smart Grid Act. The legislation directs the construction of a smart grid through a $2.6 billion 10-year program. Half of the dollars targeted at refurbishing the existing grid and half targeted towards smart technology designed to improve reliability and open a world 
of choice and control for consumers. Technically, the smart grid is a communications or internet overlay on the grid that gives us visibility to what's happening on the grid allowing us to move from a fix at failure mode of operation in which we exist today to a predict and prevent business strategy. On the question of visibility, consider this. OnStar can turn your car on from 50 miles away, but unless you call ComEd, we don't know you're out of power two blocks away. <laughs> Siri can give you the capital of Azerbaijan in seconds, but it takes us hours and sometimes days to assess the damage in the face of a storm and give you a restoration estimate. It's time for this industry to join the digital world. The smart grid also moves us from a one-size-fits-all product to a transparent world of choice and customer control. Today, you can choose from thousands of styles of shoes at a similar number of price points. But traditionally in the electricity industry, all customers pay one price, receive the same resource mix, and have no idea how much they purchased of our product or what they paid for it until they get the bill at the end of the month and it's too late to do anything about it. With smart grid technology, you will be able to select a product that uses solar off your own rooftop, a product that follows the power markets, or a product that provides a rebate if you reduce usage during peak hours. Finally, the legislation that has paved the way for the smart grid creates an accountability model like no other we are aware of. The utilities under this model must deliver customer benefits by meeting performance standards such as fewer outages, faster restoration times, fewer bill estimations, or face financial penalties. So we began the journey in January of this year. We're 10 months in, nine years to go, and we've already accomplished a great deal. We have replaced or refurbished over 361 miles of underground cable, 35 miles of mainline cable, 2,300 utility poles, and added almost 30 miles of tree-resistant cable to our system. All of these programs are proceeding at at least double the pace of any previous year. We have installed 380 smart switches. These are devices that reroute power in the event of a fault, and in this year alone, we have avoided 70,000 power outages by virtue of this technology. We have added new com communications channels for our customers. You can reach us by text, by iPhone app, by website, Twitter, and Facebook. You can report an outage on any one of those channels and we will communicate back to you. This year, JD Power designated ComEd as one of the two best practices utility in the country on mobile-enabled customer communications. We are quite proud of that fact. But this is just the beginning and we have much more work to do. But I want to, if you will allow me, show you how some of the new technology is already improving your service. We have three things to show you. This year, we have smart boarded our storm restoration logistics and created crew deployment outage maps aligned with Google Earth. In real time, our smart boards pinpoint outages and the location of our crews, and it allows us to move crews around to take care of outage much more quickly. So this is our service territory. Um, the dots, the blue and the yellow are outages. These are real time. What you're seeing is real time. We always just had, had some wind and, uh, and rain yesterday and we're getting to the end of that restoration. Um, but the colors tell us the uh, amount and type of outage. And then you see where our crews are. We also have supply uh, depots uh, overlaid in that when we have big storms. And uh, this is monumental in allowing us to more efficiently uh, move crews around the system and take care of outages. It gives us vis visibility uh, onto our system that we've never had before. And when you have half a million customers out, this is really important. Um, there's also a box here that gives you um, the cause of the outage, the uh, uh, number out, the uh, crew status, and the estimated time of restoration and our outage map that's available to customers. This is what we use in our command center. But in our outage map for customers, that uh, information is available on a similar map. So we are quite excited about this. The second thing I want to show you is our smart substations. We are close to finishing our second smart substation, the Wallace substation on West 81st Street on the south side of Chicago. This serves 28,000 customers. At its essence, a smart substation is an effort to place hundreds of sensors on very sensitive equipment 
to take constant health readings of this equipment and send the information back to our command center. This screen is a live feed from our first and only smart substation now located in Oak Park. The screen provides our engineering and operations personnel with an overall view of the substation, allowing us to quickly assess the health of the substation. And what happens is if we get an alert, it'll actually send an email out to the appropriate operators. Um, so you don't have to constantly watch the screen, you actually get real-time information coming in. So this is the general health of the substation. This is breakers uh, down at the bottom. It shows you the loading, the bus. Um, the second um, slide that we're going to show you, or the second uh, feed, and this is live, is a transformer, which is one of the big pieces of equipment in our substations. And these are multi-million dollar pieces of equipment. This tells you the oil temperature. It tells you the loading. Uh, if you look to the left of the transformer, that little green bar, it tells you what percentage of total nameplate loading we have. So if there's too much happening on the transformer, you can make some changes. And if you look over on the right side of the transformer, it actually shows you that the fans are working. Um, keeping these transformers cool is a very, very important thing to do. Now, where we don't have um, smart substations, uh, we gather this information manually by an employee with a clipboard who takes temperature readings and gassing levels and assesses the state of fans and batteries. If something occurred between visits, we wouldn't see it. And the risk is that we lose a multi-million dollar piece of equipment that could have been saved and cause thousands of outages that could have been avoided. Wallace will be complete at the end of the year and you'll be happy to know that substations feeding O'Hare and Midway are in next year's plan. The last thing I want to show you is the place where the smart grid earns its stripes, the intersection of smart meters and smart switches. Smart meters provide customers with on-the-spot usage and price information that enable them to better manage their energy consumption and control costs. But as you're about to see, smart meters help us operationally. They allow us to mo monitor uh, outages in real time uh, and deal with restorations much more effectively. So we have a smart grid pilot, 130,000 meters, um, in Humboldt Park and just west of the city in Oak Park, Berwyn, and that general vicinity. What this is is a real um, feed uh, from last summer, summer of 2011, of our smart meter pilot area. And it's a storm coming through. And the yellow dots are lightning strikes. So you can see the storm coming through the territory. Um, the red and green area are our meters. And what you see happening here is the lightning comes through. The lightning comes through. Rich, thank you. <laughs> and you see the meters go red. And then you automatically see them go green. And the reason they go green is this is the smart switches. The distribution automation brings people back to power immediately. What you see at the end is there's a red spot kind of down in the lower left, and the upper right hand corner there's another red spot. That's where the damage to the system is permanent. We can immediately send our crews out there to the precise spot where we know the damage is based on this. So most customers came back to power immediately. A few customers were still out, but we knew exactly where to send the crews to report pair the damage. This is the future and this will make a huge difference in our service to customers going forward. So my goal today was to share with you a new perspective, one that views my industry through a much broader lens than is typical. The landscape of a digital world in a global economy where energy policy matters. But if open markets saving billions and digital technology transforming electric service don't persuade you that we're on the right track, I have one last pitch. Jobs. <coughs> Jobs. This investment in energy infrastructure made over the last 10 months of this program, the first 10 months of this program, has created 400 jobs, supported local businesses, and attracted new businesses to the area. We are partnering with established local businesses like Mead Electric, Intren, s and Electric, G&W Electric, HBK Engineering, and Aldridge. We are purchasing our cable for our five-year cable program from General Cable, a manufacturer from downstate to coin. General Cable added an extra shift to take on our new work. 
We are partnering with growing entrepreneurial firms like PMI Energy Solutions and Primera Engineering, all in our city. We are pleased to be working with MZI Group, a startup construction firm founded by Arthur Miller. Arthur has hired 12 electricians to work on the ComEd manhole program. These workers had been out of work for an average of 15 months before Arthur hired them on for ComEd's five-year manhole program. We have attracted new businesses to the Chicago area, including Choctaw Call, a Detroit-based distributor of maintenance, repair, and operations supply. This spring, Choctaw Call opened a distribution center near Midway Airport and is contributing significantly to the ComEd program and to the economy of the city. Finally, we at ComEd are able to begin to rebuild our own workforce for the future. And it is a workforce for the future. One of our recent graduates from Line School is Andrea Simmons. Andrea, would you please stand up? I am very proud of her. She graduated at the top of her class, and that is not easy to do. It's a very competitive program. Next time we have an ice storm, a snowstorm, or a thunderstorm, and you look out and see one of our folks up on a pole or in a bucket, check and see if it's Andrea. So there it is. We in the Chicago region and the state have this. We have this. We have the foundation for an enviable digital economy. We have energy markets that support choice and deliver some of the lowest energy rates for a significant urban area in the country. We have a 10-year plan to bring grid technology into the 21st century. We have an accountability-based regulatory model that replaces the least cost race to the bottom with an accountability-based focus on consumer value. And we have jobs. We have this, but we have to finish this. Every major turn in economic history is accompanied by a slower change in consensus. The economic or technological change occurs before we culturally have fully come to grips with what it means. We have made a great beginning here, and my hope is that we can take this exceptional roadmap and complete the journey. The landscape is our future. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Okay, who's got a question? Write them down. Here's Joyce Saxon. Please write down your questions. A lot is on the table. Thank you, Ann, for that very informative. Here we go. Thank you, Mark. Very informative talk. A lot to think about. And the questions are going to be picked up by Jack or by Jan. Jack and Jan are here. Send the questions up if you can. All right, first one, Joyce Saxon. Do you have trouble, does ComEd have trouble finding qualified employees at this point in time? Thank you. Um, we don't have trouble finding qualified employees. There are many, many people looking for work, and we do our own training. So, um, you know, it allows us to bring people in, run them. put it up as cheaply as you can, and then you go fix it every time a storm comes through. We're moving to a, a digital world where we're going to predict and prevent. And it's, to some extent, a different skill set. We will always have the skill set of, of going out and doing the construction work, but we're also going to need a skill set of data analytics. The amount of data that's going to come over this system is monumental. And one of the challenges of the digital world is sort of figuring out how you sort through data, what's important and what's not important, and how to use it operationally. So we are going to be looking for some new skill sets as we move forward. And this data analytics area is going to be a big one for us. Terrific. Thank you. Mike de Santiago asks of Primera Engineers, do you think the general public is aware of the investments ComEd is making in system reliability? How important is 
favorability rating among the public to ComEd? Um, so my answer to the first part of the question is, um, I, I don't, I, I think there's, it's mixed. I mean, I think there is some awareness um, that there's different things going on. I don't know if it's um, an awareness so much of what I've showed you or the investment, but some of the communication channels, I think people do, um, you know, are responding to that and we are getting some feedback, feedback on that. Um, I want to tell a little bit of a story. Um, I, I don't think it's it's lost on anyone that um, you know the summer of 2000 was our worst um, storm season ever. Uh, it was it was uh, beyond compare, and um, we struggled, and uh, our customers struggled, and uh, they let us know how they felt about that quite appropriately, and and we took that to heart. We uh, put together a team and uh, a storm uh, task force team and spent from September to about April or May of last year getting ready for summer of 2012. We made 60 changes to our, our storm processes, 60. Um, and they ranged from uh, how we do storm damage assessment, um, basically putting it on uh, electronic uh, 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 databases so we could move information around better, um, to the smart board uh, technology that you saw, to communications with customers. Um, and, uh, and that, I, you know, we came out of the summer this year, and I think we managed our storms more effectively, and, and we got some feedback on that. We take um, customer survey um, surveys essentially every quarter and uh, check, um, you know, check how we're doing with our customers. And actually, third quarter of this year, I'm proud to say, was our best third quarter ever. Usually, the third quarter dips for us because we're coming out of storm season, and this was our the best third quarter we ever had in in history. So I just I want to commend. You know, I've got a lot of ComEd folks here who worked uh, very hard this summer to make that happen. I want to commend that them for that. It was it was really tremendous work, and I'm I'm really proud of that. Thanks. Okay, terrific, uh, Vuk. Vojovic of Legat Architects, please describe ComEd's strategies for expanding its renewable energy sources in the Midwest market. Um, so ComEd is a wires company. Um, we do the transmission and distribution. We don't have uh, supply sources. So the renewable, I would say just a couple responses on the renewable side. One is there is a renewable um, uh, portfolio standard at the state level and that is designed to build to 25 percent of the supply purchases being renewable by 2025. It also has sort of a budget cap in there that will moderate that sum uh, as we move along. This year we're buying about eight percent of the uh, general supply through ComEd um, in renewable products, but that's really done through the Illinois Power Agency. Not a, a you know, ComEd doesn't control or manage that. Um, what I would say is that we are very interested in working with uh, a number of um, new startup companies uh, to explore uh, solar rooftop solar and uh, and and some um, um, projects like that. Uh, especially with the smart grid. It's very important um, if you've got uh, distributed generation, uh, rooftop solar, and you want to sell back into the market and buy from the grid at times, um, you need those smart meters to be able to make those um, uh, um, uh, adjustments and calculations. And so one of the things we're doing in our smart grid pilot area is testing some of this technology. So I think we're involved in renewable that way. But generally, it's state policy that's, that's set um, the renewable um, that's, uh, that's going on in Illinois. Keeping with renewable, from Dave Lundy, do you favor full implementation of the Illinois Renewable Portfolio Standard? You might want to describe what that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if yes, will you support efforts to reconcile the Renewable Portfolio Standard with municipal aggregation? I, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> I hope somebody knows. I can do that. Okay. Um, so our renewable portfolio standard is a standard that was set by the state, it's in legislation, that describes how much of the supply that's purchased for customers in the state of Illinois will be renewable versus um, fossil resources or um, nuclear resources, essentially. And uh, the, as I indicated before, it's designed to ramp up to 25% of total resources by 2025. When the policy was put in place, there was also a decision made that um, there would be essentially a, a, a cap 
on the spending. So there's a target trajectory that goes up, but there's also a budget that comes into play. And the reason that that was put in there was because not knowing where pricing would go with renewables, the state, the policymakers didn't want to sign on to 25% of purchases being renewable if in fact it was going to drive customer rates very, very high. So there's a cap in there that um, basically says renewables should be no more than about 2% of the rate um, that customers are charged. So I think that's a nice balance, um, and that was what was decided. I think this legislation was passed in 2007, and, uh, and I think that's a, you know, a reasonable balance of uh, renewables and, and environmental consciousness with, um, you know, with concern for customers' rates. Uh, so that, you know, that's the renewable portfolio portion of it. The municipal aggregation portion. Um, so municipal aggregation is this phenomenon that has occurred uh, where our customers are leaving ComEd supply for retail suppliers. Um, and one of the things that's facilitated this is the fact that municipalities can consolidate and act as facilitators for this. So they can actually go to the market and solicit bids from retailers and offer these prices to their residents. So it makes it a much more efficient market, in essence. Um, one of the concerns has been as customers move off into the market, what happens to the renewable por portfolio standard? The retailers are actually um, required to meet it um, as well, uh, not just through ComEd. They, can't, they have to buy half of it in renewable they have an option to, do, to take the other half of the cost and, uh, and put it into a fund that is designed to purchase more renewables. So, that's the, so it's structured a little differently for retailers, but there is a, a renewable portfolio standard in the realm of municipal aggregation. Is that? Sorry. That sounds great. <laughs> you know, after Tuesday, when people start talking about fossils, you know, as a Republican, I say, yeah, yeah right here. All right, you get, the, hey, hey, they finally got it. That's pretty good, all right. It took you to. Representative Ken Duncan, uh, give us the latest update with respect to the ICC ruling. What will you, what will you be requesting of the General Assembly? <laughs> Well, by way of background, um, we have, uh, there's about 12 issues that we have a debate um, with the, the ICC over, and, and they represent money to us, and they represent funding for these, these programs going forward. Um, I, our view right now is that we have, um, you know, three ways of, of approaching this. One is, you know, we can go through the courts, and, and we've filed our court papers. Um, another is we can work it out at the commission. The commission has a number of uh, cases in front of it and, and you know, could be worked out there. And the third would be um, to you know, try to go back to the legislature and resolve things um, in that realm. So we're, you know, we're sort of talking to, to everyone at this point and you know, hoping to resolve this. It's, it's important. We're very committed to this program. Uh, we think it's important work. We think it's important for the future. Um, but you know, part of the, uh, the legislative uh, um, package was, you know, if we made these investments, we, we recover our costs, and that's, that's important. So we're moving along uh, with the programs uh, as well as we can in the interim and, and trying to resolve this and looking for, um, you know, looking for, we're going to work all paths to resolution. Okay. And to wrap it up, our last question from Christopher Skokna of Twin Supplies. Do you think you could say a few words on the great ComEd incentives for lighting? Thank you. Um, so our energy efficiency programs, we have the um, fifth largest energy efficiency programs in the country. Um, they are very significant. Uh, we have energy efficiency programs for both our residential customers and our business customers. Um, over the last three years, we have saved our customers over a billion dollars. And for every dollar that we uh, invest in these programs, we save our customers seven. So they are tremendous programs. We have lighting options for customers. Uh, we provide rebates on compact fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, we also, for our business customers, if you come into us with a design to redo lighting or HVAC systems, our engineers will look at it. They'll figure out a payback. They'll provide you some incentives to help offset that cost. 
So that gives you a little bit of a sense of what we do in the lighting realm, but um, we're really proud of these energy efficiency programs. They're doing great things for our customers, and we hope you take advantage of them. Thanks. Let's hear it. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Well, you're welcome.